then. It is now six o'clock, and I would like to call to order the joint meeting of the Katadi City Council and the successor agency to the former Katadi Community Redevelopment Agency for this Tuesday, March 28th, 2023. So with that, um, could we have a roll call, please? Council Member Rivers. Here. Council Member Lemus. Here. Council Member Ford. Here. Vice Mayor Sparks. Here. Mayor Harvey. Here. Thank you for that. Then um, if you'll all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you for that. Then we will move on to approval of the minutes and notice of waiving of reading of all resolutions and ordinances introduced and or adopted under this agenda. Um, we have the city council minutes from our regular meeting of March 14th. Are there any questions? Any concerns? Then I will open this um, item up for um, public comment. Anyone wishing to make a public comment on this item you may please step forward. And I am not seeing anyone run up to the podium. Um, would you like to check um, our Zoom attendees? Uh, Mayor Harvey, there are currently no Zoom attendees, so that will end public comment. Okay, then I will bring it back to the council and I would be looking for a motion on our minutes. I move that we approve the minutes. A second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, that passes 5-0. Uh, so then we will move on to the next item, which is announcements versus meeting orientation for new attendees and viewers in conformance with the Brown Act and the adopted city council rules, the meeting agenda includes items labeled as action items, where the city council will consider an item and citizens are afforded the opportunity to provide comments relevant to the item being discussed. The meeting agenda also includes a citizen's business item, which is the designated place on the agenda where citizens have the right to say whatever they wish. The city council may or may not choose to respond to comments as the government code allows. However, if the city council declines to respond, it should not be perceived as giving credence to or agreeing with any statements that the city council or its members believe to be incorrect, misinformed, or purposefully biased. <clears throat> Next, Measure S supports police services, a variety of recreation programs for all ages, and the maintenance of our streets, parks, and public buildings. See details on the web at katadicity.org. Next, citizens interested in receiving City of Katadi community alerts via text or email are encouraged to sign up with Nixel by downloading the Everbridge app from the iOS or Android app store or by texting your zip code 94931 to 888777. Next, the city has vacancies on the Planning Commission and the Sonoma County Library Commission. See details on how to apply under latest news at katadicity.org. Next, like always, we love to hear from you, so please feel free to contact the city at 707-792-4600 or info at katadicity.org. If you have a non-emergency issue after normal business hours, you can contact us at 707-792-4611. And of course, if you have an emergency, please contact 911. Continue to look for updates on the city's website and social media channels available on Facebook, Instagram, and Nixle. And with that, we will uh, move to the approval of the final agenda. City Manager Bid, are there yes. any changes to the agenda? Thank you, Mayor. Um, no changes per se, but a couple things I do want to just point out for um, your consideration when you get to the consent calendar. 
Um, <clears throat> under item 8A, this is the letter of opposition, SB 423. There's a, uh, uh, it says it's uh, a letter of opposition to SB 423, but that's not what the letter is. The letter is, um, uh, there was some confusion in the communications from Cal Cities to, to us. And the letter that is attached isn't about SB 423, it's about um, uh, sustaining funding for homelessness programs with the budget cuts that the governor's having to uh, propose with the budget shortfalls. So that's what's attached in the packet tonight. Um, we will, we do plan though, um, because it's not as time sensitive as the letter that's in the packet that was already sent. Um, this SB 423 letter will come back at a future meeting for a council conversation. So it's not in this item, but we'll be on that future, on a future agenda item. And then just a small uh, typo to note that item 8E, which is the um, uh, the water shortage contingency plan, the res rescinding of, is um, it says regular calendar on the face of the staff report, but it, of course it's a consent calendar item. So with that, that was it. Thanks, Mayor. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, and um, in speaking with our representative from League of California Cities, uh, she's sorry that her letter was less than clear that there was actually two asks and that the uh, letter wasn't clear and the uh, attachments weren't clear. So she apologizes for that and at least we have time to get things right. So with that, um, I will open this since that an action item. I will open this up for public comment. Anyone wishing to speak on approval of the final agenda, please step forward. I'm not seeing any you know, <laughs> I see a head shake. Um, with that, um, Kevin, I, I'm not seeing any Zoom attendees at this moment. Uh, that is correct, currently no Zoom attendees. Okay, then I will bring it back to the council and we will move on to citizens business and public comment for the consent calendar items. Any member of the public wishing to speak to the council on any items listed on the consent or any matters not listed on the agenda that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council may do so at this time. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the council is not allowed to consider issues or take action on any item not listed on the agenda during this period. Pursuant to City Council Policy 2021-01, comments of any member of the public are normally restricted to a total of three minutes in length per person for matters not on the agenda and a total of three minutes per person in length for any and all items on the consent calendar. The mayor may extend the time limit for a reasonable time where a disability accommodation has been requested. So with that, I will um, open this up for citizens' business and comment. Yes, welcome. Is it appropriate and okay if I still speak to SB 423 even though it is not actually the issue at hand? This is the time that citizens can speak Wonderful. on anything. So Great. there you go. <laughs> I love the flexibility. Good <laughs> evening, Mayor Harvey, Vice Mayor Sparks, uh, council members and staff. Uh, my name is Cal Meeks. I'm the policy director for Generation Housing. Um, I realize SB 35 has garnered a fair amount of attention as of late with the recent <laughs> submission of the SB 35 application for the La Plaza View Family Departments. But really since its passage in 2017, SB 35 has, has become an engine of subsidized affordable housing production in California cities. Um, we've seen it here locally. Um, it was actually used for Woodmark Apartments in the city of Sebastopol, and it actually helped um, protect these units, these 85 units for farm workers from uh, essentially being completely um, pushed while the developer pushed out of town. It was, it was probably one of the more embattled um, uh, developments I've, I've had um, in my time in this position. Um, and, and really, although the data surrounding SB 35 isn't perfect, the Turner Center has reported that through the end of 2021, over 18,000 units have been pro uh, proposed under SB 35, with 13,000 or nearly three-fourths being affordable to those in the very low or low-income categories, something that I know is very, very important to the city of Katati. So the reality is, really, California ranks 49th out of 50 states in per capita housing units. And to address this vast need, various estimates, including the Legislative Analyst Office, recommend the state produce an additional 100,000 units annually 
beyond the expected 100,000 to 140,000 units per year. So here's why I'm here today. Before you craft the opposition letter, I'd really like to have an open conversation about the legislation, um, speak candidly, discuss where we can come to some sort of crossroad. Um, and if you do plan on sending an opposition letter, you know, I, one of my frustrations is the state removed the option for oppose unless amended or support unless amended. So now it's just a support or oppose in their system. And so if you don't clearly state in the subject line that you're opposed unless amended, it will not be reflected. And there is actually a very, there is a very good chance that they will not actually see the content of the letter. Um, and so it's really, really important that you're clear and stating exactly what you want to see in the legislation. And I'd just like to have a conversation about the legislation generally. I mean, principally, it's my job to manage just, um, excuse me, state legislation uh, for our organization. So I'm more than happy to meet with any one of you and answer any of your concerns at any point in time. Um, and I do plan on meeting with you. I I've actually been meeting to meet with several of you. It's just been a really, really tough couple of months. Um, and we're, we're almost out of it. So. Um, with that, I, I will I will leave um, I will leave it there and, and just you know um, again encourage um, open dialogue and I would love to to chat with you all. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you for your comments. Um, Kevin, I am still not seeing any Zoom attendees. Is that correct? On that is side? correct. Yes, Mayor Harvey. Okay. Uh, anyone else in the audience wishing to speak? No. Okay, and I will um, bring this back to the council. And we have, let's see, on the consent calendar, um, the letter of opposition to SB 423, which we now know as the budget change items, um, the main flushing and water treatment services for the water distribution system, awarding of a contract for the community center dance studio repairs project, purchase of a three-dimensional 3D scanner technology equipment software to record and document crime scene and accident investigations, and lastly, rescinding enactment of the stage one, 20% of the city's water shortage contingency plan and continued compliance with the state emergency drought regulations. Those are the items. So anyone wishing to pull any of those? Yeah? I just have a I just have a question. Okay. Um, yeah. Will the agenda as it shows up in the future be amended as, as far as the title for item A so that it doesn't state that we're approving a letter of opposition to SB 423? And will that be amended in the minutes? Well, so the, yeah, the recommendation is just a kind of a receive and file as if the letter had already been sent. It's just informational, um, even though the title is a bit misleading. So um, I, I would like to pull that item because I don't want it to be approved as though we did that because I think members of the public looking at the agenda, they would see that and see that we've sent a letter of opposition to SB 423, which we haven't done. <clears throat> oh. I was going to suggest that since the city manager did bring it up in approval of the, of the final agenda, I think that the final agenda should reflect a corrected title for item A. And therefore, the minute should should reflect a corrected title. Is that a reasonable way to handle it? I I was just suggesting to Damien that he pull it, which by which I meant remove it from the agenda, and then you know you printed the agenda that was published already, so so that exists. But in the minutes, it can indicate that that item was removed. Um, but that's not my job to make that decision. Yeah, I mean, if the council's if the council's okay with that solution, that would be one way to handle it. And then, because it, it's just a receive and file, was the act, there was no action anyway. So you can just pull it, and you've seen the letter that went out, and we can come back with an SB 423 conversation at a future meeting. Yeah. So is that the recommendation? That, that sounds like a good plan to me. I just don't want it to show up on the minutes as though we acted on something that we didn't actually act on. <clears throat> okay. Can and I just confirm? So um, then we're going to pull item 8A, and it's going to show as a receive and file in the future agenda? Uh, so item 8A will just get pulled, and in the minutes it will reflect that it was just pulled off the agenda and wasn't considered. Okay. Um, in a future agenda, there will be something with the same title. Mm -hmm. 
or something like this, but it'll be an actual consideration of um, SB 423. Okay. Except it won't be a receiving file. It won't be just a consider. It won't be a receiving file. It will be an actual conversation about it because we do have time for that conversation. Okay. Thank you. So is it fair to say that if a motion would ma be made, it would be on items B through E? Is that? Um, but, uh, yes, I, th I think it also could be a motion could be pull 8A and approve B3. Make sure we do this. That's right. correct. So you, you, could, you could make a motion to remove item A from the agenda and approve the balance of the consent calendar B3. Okay. Is that clear? Or you could mine? just say, I agree with what the attorney said as your motion. <laughs> okay. All right. I make a motion as, as per the language discussed by our amazing city attorney. Second. All right. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. That passes 5 0. Well, that was certainly fun. <laughs> But as usual, we got through it. So now we will move on to direction on future agenda items. I am not seeing anybody rush to the microphone with that. And is, it, is this so we can ask for agenda items? Or? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, one thing I would like to, uh, for us to consider is to look at some of the proclamations and resolutions that we do on an annual basis. I'm not sure at what point we can discuss. I know I discussed with the um, city manager and see how we can um, bring forward some resolution of proclamations for like uh, Women's History, um, Black History Month, um, uh, Latino Heritage, Pride, you know, uh, some of the, maybe not everything, because I, I do agree that there's, there's a lot of different variety of different proclamation resolutions, but maybe agree on a, on a slate of them. So that's something I'd like to bring up. Fair enough. Okay, you got that city manager? Okay. I see him writing, so that must mean he yeah, we, we've given him we've given him work to do. Okay, so then we will move on to public hearings, and this is an action item, and it's the 2023 20, housing element update and the associated general plan environmental impact report EIR addendum, and we will um, open that up and help help me again. Uh, our masterful city attorney. Um, do we open public comment first and then discuss our concerns, or do we? Can we discuss our concerns and open our questions, and then do, does it matter? Uh, it does not matter. I think your tradition has been to ask questions of staff. Yes. Open the public hearing, ask questions of staff, hear from the public, and then deliberate. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that I was going in the right order, since this is one of those things that we do once every eight years. <laughs> so, will we have a staff report on this Thank lovely you, Mayor stack Harvey. of paper? We absolutely will. And uh, our housing element consultant, Four Leaf, um, uh, has been working on this for close to two years now, and Luke Lindenbush, a housing policy planner for their, uh, that firm, is here to present, and he and myself will be available for any questions. The presen this presentation is not in the packet. All right, well, thank you very much, Noah, for that. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Harvey and Council. My name is Luke Lindenbush. I'm a housing policy planner with Four Leaf. Uh, you've seen me a handful of times over the last year and a half, but it's good to see you in person at the dais for the first time. Uh, as Noah mentioned, this has really been a year and a half of work, uh, and we're very excited to be at this point, uh, to have gotten some good feedback from HCD on our initial draft, and to be bringing this adoption draft to you following the recommendation from the Planning Commission. Uh, so with the next slide, uh, just going into where, where we're going to be covering today. First off, just going to be going into the background of really how we got here over the last 18 months, and then look at some of the key pieces of the housing element itself, the housing strategy, which comprises the goals, policies, and programs, the site's inventory, highlighting where sites have changed since the last time we came to you a couple months ago, and then really going into the next steps following adoption, going into housing element certification. So first off, just looking at where we've been over, over the course of uh, this project for the last 18 months. Uh, first off, we had uh, did a lot of background research that comprises the technical background report, uh, one of the heftier parts of your very hefty packet. Uh, we held a kickoff workshop in September, I believe, of 2021, where we went over the changes in state housing law uh, and 
really looked at how this housing element is a lot different, uh, how the requirements are much more extensive, uh, and what that was going to mean for the formation of the document. Uh, in February 2022, we came back to the Planning Commission and Council and looked into some of the big questions, uh, again, really looking at the meat of those two uh, sections with the housing strategy and the sites and getting the input on how we should proceed with both of those. We then came back to the Commission and Council in June 2022 and held a workshop as those uh, details became more, more fully formed, got ideas from the Council and Commission on which policies and programs were not conducive to Katati's values and which ones should be pulled, uh, and which sites were going to be more effective than others. Uh, then in October, we released, uh, well, I'll also just add in June 2022 as well, we had really extensive community um, engagement, which I'll go into a little bit more later on, but that was one of the times where we had standalone workshops in the community uh, during day and night, bilingual events, uh, in addition to all, some of the tabling that we did at a number of community events uh, that were already existing in, community, in the community, like the Halloween Carnival. Uh, so in October, uh, that was the release of the, the draft housing element for public review, which was extensively circulated for 30 days. Uh, and we incorporated public comment, uh, submitted that to HCD for our first initial draft. And that was really when the, the extended review period of 90 days with HCD went into effect. Uh, so that happened from November to February. Uh, they came back with comments for us just a couple days before we got our letter back, uh, just in time for us to make some quick revisions uh, that were really responsive to what HCD was needing to see in the document. So that was put out for another seven days of public review and we received our letter on February 16th. So now uh, as, as we move into this next stage, uh, we're really looking at refining the feedback that we got in HCD's letter. Uh, we were grateful and thankful to receive a relatively short letter. There weren't any huge surprises in there, uh, really because we've been paying attention to the statutory requirements, paying attention to feedback from the community. Uh, and at this point, we're paying attention to what HCD has to say to us in writing. So that's where the uh, track changes version of these documents uh, reflect, are really looking at how we can be responsive to HCD's uh, feedback in the initial draft letter we received on the 16th. So uh, after this housing element is adopted, we can achieve certification. Next slide, please. So really breaking down the sections of the housing element, uh, the introduction and summary covers uh, some of the demographic research that goes into making up the housing element. And most of it comes from the American Community Survey census data, uh, really pulled in large part from some of the appendices that are included within your document, uh, the ABAG housing data needs workbook, uh, and also a segregation report that was provided by AHCD to respond to some of the affirmatively furthering fair housing requirements in this housing element cycle. Next, after section one, the introduction, we have the housing strategy, which as I mentioned, is the goals, policies, and programs. Uh, we kept the same goals uh, from the last housing element. Uh, again, this is a housing element update, so really building on the existing work that the community's been doing. And we also changed some of the, the policies and programs to be responsive to community feedback, state requirements, uh, and really uh, make, make the best housing element that we could for the statutory requirements that we're dealing with. Section three is the housing sites. Uh, so that doesn't just include what you might think of as sites uh, that are, you know, just vacant lots. Uh, there, there's requirements for, for looking at non-vacant lots, but that also includes assumptions about your development patterns over the next eight years. So that includes uh, assumptions based on past projections of how many ADUs have been permitted, and you can take credit for that. In addition, that includes pipeline projects, which as we'll go into in just a little bit, really cover the bulk of the city's arena or regional housing needs allocation. Lastly, um, there's the technical background report, which as I mentioned is a very hefty document. Uh, that is, you know, all of the stuff that isn't in the front document that's going to be a chapter of your general plan upon adoption. But that includes an analysis of housing needs, uh, what, what the needs are, as particularly for special needs groups, uh, including everything from everyone from extremely low income households, farm workers, people experiencing homelessness, female headed households. And those are statutory uh, requirements of special needs households. Um, that, that are have been determined by HCD over the last half century or so um, through housing element law. So there's needs. Uh, resources, uh, which is looking at the existing resources that the city has within the community to respond to the needs of housing, uh, in addition to looking at federal, state, and local resources, primarily funding. Another portion of uh, the technical background report is housing constraints. That's really broken down uh, into two different types of constraints, governmental and non-governmental. So governmental constraints uh, can be anything from fees to permitting timelines, uh, procedures, uh, really anything that the local government has control over. Those are governmental constraints. 
And then non-governmental constraints uh, are sometimes referred to as physical constraints, but that's a little bit limited because it is things like fires, flood, earthquake, all of which needs to be an analyzed within the technical background report. But it also includes things that the government has less control over, like community opposition, um, really the externalities that nevertheless constrain the ability for the city to develop housing. And finally, uh, the appendices and supporting materials. Uh, as I mentioned, it includes some of the information that we've received from ABAG, which is prepared for every jurisdiction in the nine county Bay Area. That also includes a really detailed look at all of the community outreach that was done over the course of the last 18 months. Uh, so that includes a community engagement appendix that summarizes all of the actions that were taken over the course of the process. And it also has uh, all of the comments that we received in the community uh, housing needs and opportunities survey, which we got several hundred responses on, in addition to direct comments that we received during various periods of public review. So those are the sections of the housing element. I'll take a brief moment to pause to see if there are any questions from the council just on the general structure. Yeah, council member Rivers. Hi, I, I, so I was completely overwhelmed by the 908 page um, document that we got on Tuesday and we're expected to be able to vote on today. Um, and as a member of the community who does work full time, I was not able to do it, so I'm gonna have to abstain today because there was no way I could get through it. Something like this could have made all the difference if this was like if there was some type of table of contents where I could see clearly what is the part that really has to be read, what is supporting, you know, like all that type of thing, it could have made a huge difference. And I, I'm, if you can hear the frustration in my voice, I'm very upset because I really want to be able to contribute. That's why I wanted to be on the council and I cannot because because of how it was presented. So thank you for putting this together. It's really unfortunate this wasn't, you know, the packet wasn't set up this way. Completely understand. Thank you so much for, for being candid on that, Council Member Rivers. And it, it is, it's a, you know, there's a ton of work here. And especially with the amount of requirements that we're dealing with, a lot of times it does feel that, you know, sometimes we're writing this document more for the state than we are for the community uh, due to the, the level of requirements that are there. So I hope that some of the supporting documents that have been included can, can just sort of help get a sense of, you know, especially the program table provides, you know, a sense of, you know, where, why these programs are coming about, which ones require funding. And then there's also a statutory checklist that's included within the packet that, you know, just sort of says where we're responding to state law, um, but completely sympathize and empathize with the fact that this is an overwhelming amount of information. And, you know, just if, if me who, you know, I want to do this, this is important to me, feels this way, how does a member of the public who wants to contribute feel, right? Like I can't even imagine. So I, you know, thank you for this. And, and I'm hoping that maybe moving forward we can have some kind of table of contents around it so that it's it's more chunked this way. Thank you. Certainly, thank you. Anyone else? I do have one, one more suggestion, just, just a suggestion. Um, attachment to Exhibit A, the response to um, HCD findings. I wanted to be sure that they tracked with the document itself so I actually went into the document and found which page these items were addressed. So um, as a suggestion in the response, if you um, could in the future put a page number as to where that was Certainly. so that it would make it easier because I, I was able to find them all, but it did take me a little bit um, to find them. Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor Harvey. I, I just had a question about um, that same table that Mayor Harvey you just mentioned. Is that was that um, provided in this format to HCD? Is this something we're going to provide to HCD, or is that just for our benefit? That is provided to HCD. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. For and that's that's essentially the letter that we received back from HCD in the left column, and then the response on the right. Okay. Great. Uh, well, if nothing else. All right. Did you want to go on? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Did you um, have a question, Sylvia, before he? I'm here. Okay. okay, all right, just, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, so now moving into the community engagement side of the process. Um, first off, I just, I want to thank as well, um, you know, because you've, I've been mostly the person speaking with you, but I just want to say, you know, this has been a huge team that's really gone into this work. So um, this is a good time to pause because we've had three separate firms working on this. So 
Um, first off, since we're on the community engagement slide, I just want to say thank you to Civic Edge Consulting for all of their work on this, Paisley and Kate, who've been part of it. Um, everybody from my team, uh, led by Jane Riley, including uh, Elliot, Tokara, Jackie, uh, Nejat, and Denise, who have all been really integral parts of developing the document that's in front of you. And then in addition, with the CEQA addendum that's, that's before you, that was prepared by Rincon Consultants, read by, led by Darcy uh, Kremen and Eileen Mahoney. So just wanted to put that out there really quick, uh, some acknowledgments, because I've been the one in front of you, but it definitely has not been me doing this. Um, moving into just breaking down the community engagement side of it. Um, so first off, we had the kickoff public workshop. Had an, as, as I mentioned, we have the big policy uh, questions and housing strategy workshops as well before both the Planning Commission and City Council. We additionally had a housing element update website that was updated with information on the process as it moved forward, uh, including a breakdown of the regional housing needs allocation uh, and how many units the city had to zone for per income category. And there was also a whiteboard video that was bilingual and provided on the website that you know, really just goes through what is a housing element uh, and wh why does this process matter. In addition, public review drafts were circulated with every member of the city's housing interest list, along with everyone who had come to our events, who had taken the community housing needs and opportunities survey, which, as I mentioned, was also a really integral part uh, and the main way that we solicited feedback over the initial stages of the project. In addition, uh, for the housing strategy, uh, those were those months in June that we had community events at Katati Coffee Company in the Katati Room, and that also was partnered with canvassing uh, to special needs uh, air, um, populations within the city. Uh, that included mobile home park residents and residents of senior housing facilities as well. Uh, so we really made sure that, that we weren't just holding the events, but we were getting the word out to make sure that people came to them. Uh, in addition, we held community focus groups, uh, which included community-based organizations, service providers, and developers, both market rate and nonprofit developers, homeless service providers. That was held in conjunction with the city of Rohnert Park and gave us an opportunity to maximize and get, get really efficient uh, results and feedback on uh, two communities that are very close and don't always work closely together, but it was a good opportunity to partner as well. Um, so with that, we can move on. Next, we're going to go into the housing strategy, which is the goals, policies, and programs. Uh, looking at the five goals of the housing element, uh, these are really the same goals as the fifth cycle housing element, but each of the goals were very long. Um, they're, they had you know, multi-sentence multi titles, so we really wanted to make sure that this is something that the community can, you know, it can be palatable for the community. So uh, making them more of taglines that can be structured underneath each of these given goals, uh, which are resilient and safe housing housing production, affordable, attainable, and accessible housing, affirmatively furthering fair housing, uh, which is a, a strong new state requirement, uh, and community engagement as well. Next slide. So looking at where the programs were changing and where these changes were coming from, uh, as I mentioned, laws, including new housing element laws, were a big part of the picture. Uh, the housing element law, uh, in particular, was directly amended many times over the last cycle. Uh, but there's also beyond the housing element, just a lot to do with housing production, uh, including SB 35, which has already come up tonight, uh, AB 686, which uh, took the federal program affirmatively furthering fair housing, uh, which was rescinded under the federal administration, made it a, a California policy, uh, and the housing element is where cities are required to address it. Uh, so a number, I can, I can go into many more. Of course, you know, the ADU landscape has changed over the last eight years. Uh, pretty much anything you can think of with housing, it's a little bit different this time uh, addressing uh, California laws in this document. In addition, uh, receiving input from the public and stakeholders was of, of strong importance for us uh, to make sure that, again, we're not just trying to write this document for the state of California, but this is, this, this is and should be a document for Katati. Uh, in addition, housing development targets, or RENA, the Regional Housing Needs Allocation, uh, drove consideration of our programs, including some of the ones that changed with feedback from HCD, which we'll get into in a moment. Existing and continuing actions or programs comprised the bulk of the housing element. Some of them were changed, and some of them may non-standably continue to change, uh, based just with looking at how time frames, metrics, uh, geographic targeting, really the level of detail that HCD is wanting to see in these programs, uh, HCD being the Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, has just grown in this cycle, uh, and we're still getting a sense of really what level of granularity they want with these programs, uh, in part because this is uh, ultimately uh, 
these, this is the, the first housing element that is really going to be enforced. Um, they have been in the past, but this is one where through the annual planning report, uh, HCD is really going to be checking with every city to make sure that uh, you're doing what you're going to say, say you'll be doing in your programs. Uh, and finally, commission and city council feedback uh, has been of strong importance for us as we look through considering all of the programs uh, in each of uh, now the four times that we've come to the, the council and commission. It's been shaping each step of the way. See next slide. Uh, looking at new programs, uh, these are the ones that were added uh, recently. Um, to, so uh, since the last time uh, you came to us, some of the, the programs uh, dropped off and, and were stricken from, from the housing element per commission and council feedback. Uh, but these are really the ones that uh, continued uh, and, and are I just want to highlight these in addition to looking at the program table and where all of these programs came from uh, because these are the ones that are ultimately changing. Um, the Essential Housing Bond Financing Program uh, deals with uh, looking at preservation of existing affordable housing that's at risk of losing deed restrictions. Cottage housing is an existing uh, program, as you know, in the city of Katadi, uh, but this is, it's, it's new in terms of the housing element cycle, so we included that as well to take credit for the work that the city's doing and continue to evaluate it through the planning cycle. Santero Way rezoning to affirmatively further fair housing. Uh, this is included and was more included more recently, in large part because there are different resource areas uh, that are determined by the California Tax Credit Allocation Committee and the Housing and Community Development Department that look at uh, resource designations based on economic, education, and environmental scores. Uh, those are uh, given resource uh, designations from low to highest, uh, and Katadi has. Uh, census tracts that exist in both low and moderate resource areas. Uh, so the, the east side of the city includes, uh, which includes Santero Way as the moderate resource area. So HCD is really wanting to make sure that whatever your highest resource area is, that there's at least some effort if there aren't sites included in there uh, to increase housing development capacity in those areas as much as possible over the planning cycle. Um, so that's not making really any decisions right now about what is to be done there, since that's its own separate process, but one that will be undertaken through the um, housing element planning period. In addition, support development of proposed projects. Uh, this was directly in response to HCD's letter from the 16th of February, and this includes uh, an existing commitment that the city has to provide $25,000 in uh, funding to 100% affordable housing projects that are compatible and consistent with the city's zoning. Uh, in addition, the pro-housing designation, uh, which uh, the City Council authorized moving forward with last month, is included in there uh, to, um, that the, to uh, commit the city to applying for the pro-housing designation within the next year or two, I believe. Uh, and the last three anti-displacement actions, culturally appropriate facilitation and involvement in accessible and transparent information, really are all concentrated underneath goal four, affirmatively furthering fair housing, and are directly responsive uh, to AB 686 of 2019, the fair housing laws. Um, so I'll pause to see if there's any questions on the new programs. Sorry, that, that, so in, in development, support development of proposed projects, you said 25,000, existing $25,000, is that per unit commitment to? Per project. Per project, 25,000. Okay, that's a fairly minimal commitment. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Okay, anything else on these? With that, I think we can move forward. I'm really looking at the housing sites. Uh, next, uh, section three of the document. Uh, looking at the regional housing needs allocation, uh, you can see that it increased substantially. Uh, this is this is the case for you know really every city uh, in most cities at least uh, in the state of California between the housing cycles, uh, with a 71 percent increase overall and higher increase in uh, the moderate and lower income uh, groups. So uh, looking at 234 units overall, uh, this is a good opportunity to re just remind that it's not just about finding development capacity for 234 units, but uh, there also needs to, they need to be able to support affordable housing at the lower income uh, levels. And ultimately what this means is that it has to comply with state determinations of default density, uh, which for Katadi is 20 units, 20, develop, uh, 20 units per acre. Uh, and uh, those sites have been identified within the housing element. So next slide, we'll be looking further at the arena and how, how we're really taking care of it. Uh, so as you can see directly below the first line, the majority of, of the city's arena is, you know, beyond just seven units shy in the moderate income category. 
and beyond is being taken care of by pipeline projects. And those are planned, approved, uh, and under construction projects uh, that are anticipated to be, be developed within the six cycle. So there's a substantial buffer here on above moderate income, a pretty decent buffer on lower income, uh, and again, just a little shy on moderate income. And you may be wondering why, you know, very low income and low income uh, and extremely low income are collapsed. Uh, and that's really because in terms of determining sites, uh, you can count those income categories uh, in bulk uh, because they have the same requirements for, you know, 20 dwelling units per acre and that they have to be a certain size. They have to be between a half uh, an acre and can't be, uh, have to be larger than a half acre and, and smaller than 10 acres. So uh, that's, that's really the requirements for lower income and why it's bunched, but ultimately the city is still responsible for uh, permitting the, the level of units that are stipulated for extremely low income, very low income, and low income. Uh, so moving from there, uh, ADUs and JADUs really cover uh, most of the arena at that point, uh, including in lower income categories, but still just a slight buffer on moderate which allowed us in our strategy to be relatively conservative on how many housing sites we were including uh, in this housing element. There's uh, certain requirements for reuse of sites that require uh, you know, a rezoning, that it has to be approved by, by right if it's used in multiple planning cycles. And following feedback from the commission and council in June with our first pass at the sites so, of, eh, I don't know about that site, you know, the owner isn't particularly interested, that kind of local context that's really important for us to figure out sort of you know, what is actually likely to develop within the planning cycle of the next eight years, uh, that was able to, to allow us to whittle it down to a point where we have 105 units across income categories that are covered by vacant sites. Um, we don't have any non-vacant sites in the inventory, uh, which also have a higher burden of proof. So when you look at the total of units, uh, we're at 812, which is substantially higher than the total uh, arena, uh, and have a, a substantial buffer in each of the categories. Uh, Due to economic uncertainty um, that's likely over the planning cycle, uh, it's good to have a higher buffer. Uh, really, our ultimate recommendation is generally that you go about 30% on each income category. Uh, but this is a good place for the city to be, especially given the fact that the large majority of the, the units are in pipeline projects. Um, so if, are there any questions on that? We'll just, let's actually move, just move into the map so you can see where they are. Can I? Uh, I, I do have sure. one question. Yeah. So um, I was noticing that a lot of the sites are not deed restricted. And so does, does RENA or HCD care about that as far as when you count them? Because I noticed um, in particular ADUs that there is a fair number of them that are not deed restricted. So yeah, so it's a little bit different for, for sites and for ADUs. For sites, again, it really just has to have the, the site characteristics. And if it develops as something else, uh, then it's important for the city to have a backup plan, and the mm -hmm. city will maintain an administrative list over the planning cycle. Um, if you know one of your sites that you were banking on for lower income housing develops as commercial, or you know, things, things that you know inevitably happen with vacant sites. For ADUs, uh, those are really broken down based on a survey that was done by ABAG MTC. Uh, looking at what is sort of the average affordability of ADUs as they are uh, rented out or, you know, rented out rent-free to family members. Um, and all of that really factored into how they broke it down based off of income category, which was 30% each for very low, low and moderate, and then 10% for above moderate. Um, as you can imagine, some people, that's surprising to some people, like, oh, if only, you know, 10% of these ADUs are, are actually, um, you know, market rate. Um, I've, I've certainly seen ADUs that are rented out pretty expensive here in Sonoma County. Uh, but ultimately, these assumptions are being supported by uh, local monitoring that's being done by the Community Development Department, uh, surveys to people after you know, they develop their ADUs to really make sure that you know, they are developing at the incomes that are being assumed. Um, I would also just say in general, uh, with ADUs included in there is a relatively small number and the extent of the buffer that you have, especially with pipeline projects and sites, it's probably not going to get to a point where you know you incur no net loss territory um, and and have to you know substantially reconsider your arena as a result of ADUs. Um, but the city is aware that you know, the survey is what it is, and HCD has accepted that as a safe harbor assumption. Uh, but if those don't bear out, then there are, there are a number of backup plans. And I would just add, Mayor, uh, any affordable housing units that are built as a part of those pipeline projects that we're mm -hmm. counting on will be deed restricted. They will be. Okay. Correct. All right. Because that was sort of my concern is a lot of times we get projects and they could say, oh, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And then, you know, gee, 
miraculously, they end up being market rates. So I'm glad to hear that they will be deed restricted because that's really the only way that we have and managed to make sure that they stay um, affordable. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you, Mayor Harvey. Uh, yeah. Uh, Councilmember Rivers. Yeah, I wanted to ask about um, specifically, well, two things, the ADUs and then also um, what is already existed and vacant right now versus what is projected to be built in the future. And then the comment you made about um, ADUs um, being rented for free to family members, is that considered low income even if the family members are not low income? Like how does that work? Yeah, for the purposes of that survey that ABAC did, uh, it was based on rents. Um, so what, you know, what rent would constitute 30% of any given you know, annual income that falls into each of those categories. So something that was rented out for free to a family member uh, was considered very low income um, for the purposes of that survey. So I bring that up because you know, I, I hear where you're coming from and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily make complete sense, but it's, HCD has given it uh, the stamp of approval. So those are the parameters we can work with. Uh, and then in terms of, you know, looking at pipeline projects and sites, those will be the next two slides we look at, sort of, you know, which ones are, are projects that are proposed or approved and, and then the, the vacant sites. Did you have a question there? Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a question. I, it might be premature, yeah, that's but okay. the question is just regarding, I noticed on the, the revised draft, uh, a lot of the non-vacant sites were removed, and it seemed to be because HCD was asking for some more extensive analysis about those sites. And was that just we didn't have time to do the analysis, so it was easier to just take them take them off? Is that was yeah, I understanding we, that correctly? Yeah, we received some indication from HCD that the likelihood that you know really going through what, what would have been a very extensive process to prove that those non-vacant sites were suitable um, really wasn't worth it. Um, we also received you know just affirmative support that the sites that we did include and were intending to keep were, were acceptable. And um, in addition, just from, from the time of, you know, having the public re review draft out to the revised draft, a number of projects that were in the pipeline actually, you know, came online. Some of um, the projects that are included in the housing element in this iteration, uh, you know, just weren't on our radar six months ago. So uh, really the sites picture uh, and the need for us to include non-vacant sites uh, changed substantially since the last time we came to the council in June. Okay. And a real quick follow-up, um, will those non-vacant sites remain on our administrative list as sort of a backup plan? Uh, that's or? my understanding, Community Development Director yeah. can confirm. Yeah, we're definitely keeping an eye on those, uh, on that non-vacant list, and the idea is, or I'm sorry, on the backup list, and the idea is that if, as Luke mentioned, maybe one of our downtown sites develops as a purely commercial project, then we can kind of pivot to those and demonstrate that we have not lost any of that capacity and at that time, we'll have a certified housing element, so we'll have a little bit less pressure and can take the time to demonstrate what HCD expects. Uh, similarly, um, I noticed that we took out the Wynwood apartments, and was that because of an extensive, it sounded like because of an extensive um, paperwork uh, exercise that we would have to go through and that my feeling would be that then that would extend the period for us to be able to um, complete our element. Is that a fair assessment? <laughs> so with, with the Windwood Apartments in particular, so there's a handful of restrictions on uh, using rehabilitation of existing projects. Uh, you can only use it for 25% of each arena category. Um, so that's, that's one restriction on it. Uh, the other one is ultimately that if it's something that was occupied or voted on in one cycle and then you know, or then was was continuing to be developed as a project or, you know, rehabilitated or, or the, the deed restriction went through in, in the next cycle. There's a number of requirements in, in a sort of arcane HCD process called the Alternative Adequate Sites Checklist, uh, which, you know, sort of puts it in one bucket uh, of either it's a preservation project and if it doesn't check all of the boxes, then it becomes a rehabilitation project. Uh, and it seemed that Wynwood just wasn't really falling into either of those categories. And uh, it, it just, it, it was, ACD ultimately gave us the indication that, you know, Wynwood wouldn't be able to be counted toward the six cycle arena. Um, with that said, uh, we want to ensure that the city gets credit for it. Uh, and I'm looking into it with Director House to see if those units can be included in the fifth cycle arena. Oh, okay. That's good. Because it's unfortunate because we did put, you know, a, a fair amount of money into that and, and they're good you know, quality units that people um, are living in and, and they're going to get rehabilitated. So I think that that's 
sort of the thing that HCD wants us to do, and so it was a little unfortunate to see that we had to pull that back out because it would then encourage you not to want to do things like that in, in the future if you're, you know, if you're not going to get credit for it. Certainly, and, and the fact that we could only count 25% of the arena, I think, you know, it's, it's absolutely right that that could act as a disincentive to have those kind of projects, especially in a city with a small arena. Right. Thank you. Alternative adequate sites checklist. <laughs> checklist. Yeah. You know, the AASC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be confused with the AHSC or any of the other million acronyms out there. Good yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, next slide, please. So, this is really the map of pipeline projects uh, looking from. Uh, west to east, uh, again, this, this changed pretty substantially over the last nine months uh, with a number of projects, particularly out on Gravenstein Highway with Reds Residential, Redwood Row, and Katati Village coming forward, uh, and, and those unit counts coming, becoming more clear as well. Um, the La Plaza View project is counted in, in the pipeline projects as well, and I'll just note on that one, uh, given the fact that there is an approved application and then there is also an application that is uh, currently proposed with a different unit count, uh, what we did on that one is essentially split the difference between the units, uh, so you weren't assuming too much or too little, uh, and so so that's that's where that is at with that. Um, and then there's also the Lasker Lane Pink Viking, which is also a relatively new project uh, that's part of the city's pipeline. Um, the East Katati Cottage Housing and Katati Station, which is approved as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so these are the remaining sites. Uh, that uh, have been included. We just have three sites left. Um, site number one uh, is, is site, sites number one and two are both located within the downtown uh, specific plan. Uh, the second one being uh, a portion of uh, the St. Joseph Way Church site, uh, for the most part, uh, because it's a large, uh, because it's a large parcel, uh, we wouldn't be able to include it and assume affordable housing uh, with the entire parcel. Uh, so one of the comments we received from HCD was really specifying where that would actually be uh, included in the housing element inventory. Uh, so that's included within uh, the revisions to, to the adoption draft housing element as well. And then there's also uh, a site on the third site on Alder Avenue, uh, which was included uh, in the site's inventory simply because of the level of development that's happening uh, in that area. Um, and, and giving the city the ability to consider that as a housing site moving forward. Are there any questions on pipeline projects or housing sites? Okay. So moving forward, uh, this is really looking more granularly, uh, a little bit of you know, moving beyond the new programs, but looking at what is really in responses, uh, changes in response to HCD's comments. So in the top left, we see expanded geographic context of programs. Uh, that is, you know, one of the areas where specifically if there are areas that are looking at programs that are responding to contributing factors to fair housing issues or areas that are specifically called out by HCD as needing some specific attention in a particular part of the city, uh, that's where the geographic context comes in. Uh, we did it for each of the programs because it was pretty clear sort of in a city the scale of Katadi, which ones are going to be applied citywide and which ones had more specific geographic targeting like you know, programs relating to specific plan areas or a capital improvement plan, uh, you know, that have sort of a geographic nature to them in some way. Uh, in addition, prioritizing capital improvement investments uh, was included as well, and that was part of the geographic targeting, really looking at, you know, how are housing developments, particularly affordable housing developments, and the capital improvement plan going to interface with each other in the planning cycle. As I mentioned previously, the Santa Rosa way rezoning to affirmatively further fair housing uh, was directly in response to HCD comments, uh, along with uh, op, op, uh, Program 2-7, which uh, provides support to affordable housing developers. Um, that includes a Katadi Village rezoning uh, that the city will participate in to facil facilitate the development of that site, in addition to that $25,000 fee subsidy for 100% affordable housing that meets the city standards included in that program as well. In addition, uh, the, some of the comments we received back from HCD uh, looked at a fee study, looking into the city's fees uh, and making sure that they're compliant with new law, uh, primarily AB 602, which requires uh, a city to either adopt impact fees that are done on a square foot basis or conduct a nexus study 
uh, to understand uh, you know, why uh, that is, isn't or shouldn't be the case. Uh, and finally, anti-displacement actions and anti-discrimination. Uh, those programs uh, that were part of affirmatively furthering for a housing goal uh, were revised as well to have some geographic targeting, timeframes, metrics. Um, really, this is just to underscore some of the details that HCD is asking for. Um, I just want to note as well that in your resolution, uh, there's language for the city manager to be able to authorize non-substantive changes to the housing element. Uh, this is really just done so if HCD says, you know, hey, is this going to you know, be taking place in this particular area? You know, when is this going to be completed by? Or you know, 20, 2026 sounds like it's a little too late, maybe change it to 2025. But those kind of adjustments can be made without having to go back to the city council. Um, but I want to be very clear with the inclusion of that in the resolution as well, that HCD will not allow us and we will not allow ourselves to put in new programs. Uh, non-substantive really means non-substantive, and it's going to be those kind of time frame metrics, geographic targeting that will be changing. Uh, and in addition, aspects of the technical background report, if you know, they ask us for additional analysis. One of the things they've been asking for a lot, including in this letter, is to have greater regional analysis. Uh, they say, you know, you assess the conditions of XYZ very well for Katadi, but how does this relate to the rest of the county, the rest of the Bay Area? Um, so any questions on these changes to programs? Okay, moving forward. This is just next steps in discussion, uh, where we're going. Uh, so the Planning Commission has recommended adoption to the City Council, uh, which has brought us here tonight. Um, this is for the adoption of both uh, the final draft or the adoption draft housing element uh, and the CEQA document uh, that is an addendum to the 2015 general plan, uh, basically just stating that we don't need to do an EIR because it's a policy document. Uh, and existing capacity that's been put forth in the general plan can be accommodated by the housing element update. Then from here, we'll submit this as soon as possible within the next couple of days uh, and submit that to HCD. Uh, they have 60 days to review. Uh, if you know we've checked all their boxes and it's non-substantive, they've been pr getting back to us pretty quickly, uh, and we hope to have that certified uh, you know, within the 60 days, potentially, uh, as we've been seeing in a couple of other communities. Uh, but definitely by around around May or June, we're anticipating that we're close enough with this letter and with the changes that have been made that certification is within reach. So that takes me to the end of the presentation, and we're open for any questions. Questions? Yes, Laura. I have several questions. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd like to refer to packet page 62, which is where that table is with all of the um, responses to the HCD comments. Sorry, I got to scroll back to page 62. Um, my first question was about the extremely low income category. Uh, so sorry, there's no bookmarks in this document to get me there, so I'm just scrolling. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, on page 62, one of the items is um, the, we added a conclusory statement assuming 50% of very low income would be extremely low income. And it, it looked like we had the option to do some kind of study that um, to, to find out how much actually would qualify as extremely low income. Mm -hmm. And I, my understanding is right now it, it doesn't matter too much what the, how much is in each, but just with the way that legislation has been changing and there's more and more emphasis being put on this, if our actual extremely low income requirement based on a, a census study came out to be less than 50%, I would like for us to have that actual number in here so that if future legislation comes out that holds us accountable to produce that much extremely low income, we wouldn't be stuck with the 50% number. Am I making sense? So yes. can you explain like what the rationale was to just go with the 50% right off the bat? Absolutely. Um, there's, there's a couple reasons for it. I think just given the extensiveness of, of a study such as that, uh, but really looking at, you know, sort of the split between extremely low income, very low income, of course, Rena, just kind of the background for this, which, which I know you understand, is there's four different uh, income categories, and 
the LI is split into extremely low income as well. Uh, the, the reason why we've gone 50-50 is just generally because the, if the number is small enough, it makes, it makes sense versus doing kind of the additional work to, you know, figure it out. And every, every time I've seen one of those studies done, which isn't very often, it, it is generally pretty close to 50-50. It might make it, you know, 60-40. So we're talking a couple units there. Um, in addition, uh, extremely low income, uh, it used to be the case that those were more difficult to develop, but I think the current housing landscape uh, it may generally be easier to develop extremely low income in some instances, just with Project Home Key funding, and you know, just you can count uh, you know a number of of different interventions towards your extremely low income housing, uh, and those can be counted up as well. Um, so, if you you know have an excess in you know anything that is a lower income bracket, uh, if you you know produce 234 ELI units tomorrow, then you know you would complete your arena because. Your, you, know, you can count up. Um, if you produce 234 moderate units, that would not be the case, uh, and you'd still have a deficiency in VLI and ELI and LI. Um, so that is, that's some of the context of that. Um, I was going to add something else, but I think, I think that primarily covers it. Okay, and um, could we at some point in the future, if we decided to go back and do that analysis and then modify our are I believe so, yeah. Number in the future? Okay. Would have to confirm. Um, that was one question. Second question was about the parking um, issue on land use controls. It's the bottom of packet page 65, top of page 66. Um, in our response, it says, um, programmatic language has been added to ensure the city takes a graduated approach to parking requirements in alignment with the density bonus law standards. Maybe Mayor Harvey could help me with this since you did the crosstalk page numbers. I just couldn't find where, <laughs> where, where that was. Where are you at? Bottom of page 65, top page 66, page 40. Page 44, and then there was more stuff about this um, about the parking on page 48 and 49. It's okay. kind of split up there. Okay, so I'll take a look at that. Yeah. yeah so the, the context for that um, and the reason HCD made the comment was because there's currently a requirement for, I believe it's two parking spaces for, you know, a variety of units, including a studio, um, which they saw as a constraint to development of smaller units. Um, so there wasn't a direct change uh, in the document, but there is a programmatic commitment, I believe, in the zoning for a variety of housing types program uh, to change that parking standard to be in alignment with uh, the parking requirements of density bonus law. So it's like a, a program that we will we will um, edit, modify our yes. <laughs> standards? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then third question um, was just about um, page 68. They said we did not include a complete site analysis, and I was just sort of confused by that because I thought we did include a site analysis. So can you just, yeah, so why did they say that? There's a couple of uh, comments in the HCD letter. They're really more procedural. Um, so, you know, they can, you know, hypothetically, they're, you know, anything they, they say, they're not going to add to anything beyond these letters. Um, so. They'll put it out there if they, you know, if it hasn't been seen yet. Um, it's customary for sites inventories to be submitted with the adopted housing element. Um, that's when when we're required to do it, uh, and it's also sent to a different uh, division of HCD than the people who are the primary reviewers of the housing element. Um, those divisions of HCD just don't really talk to each other, so they include it in almost every letter. Um, okay, it's the same for you know when they say you know the housing element requires a complete analysis of constraints. Um, you know we did a constraints analysis, but it's just saying you know if there's something that changes down the line and you know you add something else into your constraints section and it necessitates a program that we didn't mention in this first letter. It kind of just gives them the opportunity to go back and, and you know follow that through. Well, I think that maybe answers my last question because my last question was like just above item C on page sixty nine. I actually read that one out loud to my husband because it just was kind of blew my mind. <laughs> this comment: this element must be revised to add or modify goals and action based on the outcome of complete analysis. This whole thing is just I I almost felt like if I gave my students feedback like that on an essay they turned in, they'd be like, so you want me to rewrite the whole thing? Like, I don't understand. Can you just give me some context on, on that comment? Because it, it was so broad. I'd... Yeah, it's yeah. similar. I think it, it just gives them the opportunity to, okay. to go back and follow through on anything that might change. So it's um, just kind of boilerplate that they put in everybody's mm -hmm. letter? Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
Sylvia, did you have a question? Hi, yeah, I have a few questions. Um, first of all, I had a question on the um, Katari adopted draft technical background report on pa package, packet page 189, um, where it says female headed households. Is that something that HCD requires versus like a single parent household? Do you know why the designation talks about female headed households and it goes on in that section to talk about it? So I was just wondering if it's if it's a re like a requirement of um, HCD. It is, yeah. So female headed households are one of the the groups that are that have to be analyzed by the housing elements in the the needs and resources section under special needs groups. Mm -hmm. um, it, I believe that language goes back to the seventies or eighties. Um, it was it was one of the you know one of the one of the older amendments to housing element law, mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't specifically refer to single parent households. Um, which of course can be more expensive than female-headed households, and female-headed households is a larger bucket as well. So, um, it's it's kind of an interesting category because you know there there are definitely certain things you can look at, and um, you know there are certainly female-headed households that also don't have special housing needs. So, mm -hmm. it's it's somewhat general. Um, okay, okay. And then another question that I had was on um, there was a an, on packet page number two hundred eight that risk at risk assisted housing developments. It looked like there were some that were at risk of having affordability restrictions um, expired. Do you know if when they're renewed, um, is it for the term of the housing element or 10 years or is it the same? It's 10 years, yeah, so slightly longer than, than the housing element plan. So once right. the housing element is done, then it's renewed for 10 years or? Um, could you restate the question? Yeah, um, it, on 4.33, it said at risk assisted housing developments. Mm -hmm. And it said that some of the um, uh, housing elements are at risk at being converted to market rate units within a planning cycle. So once our housing element is approved, does that protect the affordability restrictions? Uh, it does not. Um, there has to be some form of committed assistance uh, funding to, to renew deed restrictions generally. Um, the housing element requires us to track which ones are at risk of, of losing those deed restrictions over the next 10 years. Um, but ultimately, then it's incumbent upon the city working with, um, you know, whatever developer, housing provider, uh, manager uh, has those units to ensure that they don't lose those deed restriction. Uh, there are uh, programs within the there's a program or there might be multiple within the housing element that uh, provide that will uh, that provide for outreach uh, the city to provide outreach to uh, the the property owners and the residents uh, to ensure that they're aware of when those deed restrictions are expiring. Okay, I think Noah's getting ready to respond. I was just going to add, okay. so the Windwood Apartments is actually an, is an example of this. Mm -hmm. I think their deed restriction was um, about 31. Eight. You have the date? 2031. Yeah. So 2031, so it was proposed to expire in 2031, so about eight years out. Mm -hmm. uh, and Burbank Housing proactively, that, that project came on the market, right? And so what could have happened is a market rate developer could have bought that project knowing that in eight years, they'll be able to convert it to full market rate and really uh, increase the rents. And, and frankly, a, a lot of those folks would have been displaced, if not all of them. So Burbank Housing became aware of that project just coming up for sale, proactively engaged with the city, and then the city council voted to fund Burbank's uh, acquisition of it to help them not only buy it, but then re, uh, renovate all those units. So all those folks get to stay there and get a renovated home and in exchange for the city's $250,000, Burbank agreed to extend that uh, affordability for 55 more years. Mm, so it was an amazing opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. um, frankly, it was Burbank's mission to provide affordable housing, and that's why we were able to take advantage of that situation. Mm -hmm. So what this is saying is in our current housing element, there's a number of other properties that are similar. Mm -hmm. uh, within about 10 years, there's, I think, one or two that might those deed restrictions are set to expire. And so it's basically saying it's incumbent upon the city to try to monitor those and be aware of when those expire, if they come up for sale or if there's an opportunity to engage with them to provide some kind of funding to buy down that affordability again and re-extend that, okay. that uh, time period. Okay, okay, thank you so much, appreciate that. And I'm glad that we're monitoring it for the future, yeah, okay. And the, the last paragraph in that section says the city of Katati contains a total of 147 low income units, none of which are at risk of being converted to market rate units within the planning cycle. Uh, affordability, I think it should be restrictions, were renewed in December 2022. It says restricts. 
um, affordability restrictions were renewed in December of 2022 for 28 units of affordable houses that were recently at risk. And it, that's Wynwood, right? The 20. Correct. So. And I, I think that's a, that's a good point to pinpoint as well, because I think there might be some that are within the 10 year period that we're required to monitor, but within the planning cycle, I think Wynwood was the only one. So the, um, the other ones that Noah was mentioning might've been 2022 or 2023, 20, sorry, 2032 or 33. Sylvia, was that all of your questions? Yeah. For right now, okay. Did you have a question, Kay? I think I'm going to be quicker. So one, I just want to say as a female-headed household, um, it doesn't necessarily mean there's only one parent or a single household. Lesbians have two female-headed households who do not have special needs. Just had to say that up front. Um, and then I just wanted to ask about this, um, the special status species section about the um, uh, California tiger salamander. And this last sentence, I don't understand what it's saying. So um, this recent development, so what I'm hearing it say is that because we built where they're supposed to live and we built anyway, therefore we can continue to build there. So I just want to make sure that's not what it's saying. I, I'm, what I'm reading is recent development and proposed projects within these areas demonstrate that CTS mitigation will not limit the ability to meet the RENA using these sites. So, so does that mean they're going to continue to use these sites? Or does it mean, like, can you explain what that means? Certainly. So any sites that are located within a protected habitat for California tiger salamander are required to undergo a certain amount of environmental review. Um, there are some sites within the city of Katati that qualify that have done an EIR and, you know, have done mitigation and, and are developable, essentially, and then there are others that are not. Uh, that really, uh, you know, it's less of a, a statement about, uh, you know, value statement in terms of development on those parcels, um, as it is to say that the city is not constrained uh, by that, that constraint to the extent of not being able to meet its arena um, as a city. So th this is uh, so meaning we don't have to build there, or we do have to build there. So we're not we're not saying we have to do either, but we're identifying that the fact that parts of the city are designated habitat right does not preclude us from being able to meet our arena. So it's this interesting situation where one state agency is saying, cities, you need to show us how you're going to build enough housing to meet your share of the Bay Area's growth, and another state agency is saying, cities, you need to uh, ensure impacts to these protected species are mitigated if development happens in those areas. So we have to balance these conflicting policies in order to essentially achieve our, our mandates from these conflicting state agencies. And yeah, I okay, like it may mean that a developer that wants to develop in those sites has to pay mitigation uh, what are you called? Credits Cred or whatever it is. Credits in order so, to be able to but develop. But they will on that still side. be allowed to do it. Yes. Is that if, what I'm hearing? if we approve, uh, so so this project doesn't um, doesn't commit the city to any this action that's before the council does not commit the city to any specific future development project and approving mitigation for those future sites. However, uh, if the city does agree to that, it will require a process where those developers essentially purchase land somewhere else to preserve it forever for sal salamanders to live on in order to impact that land. And isn't an example of that the, um, the lots out there on Gravenstein Highway, they've already That's done correct. that? That's correct. That's correct. So those lots, that, um, the few of the sites that we've identified next to Lowe's, uh -huh. they were master planned to actually build out a corporate campus 20 years ago. Uh -huh. And as a part of that approval, the developer went and purchased credits somewhere else uh, at a mitigation bank to allow that development to occur. So that's already been done. So the impacts to CTS on that land have already been mitigated. Uh, when this developer is able to find a project that is able, is financially viable, they will be able to build uh, and they have that certainty that CTS is not an issue in that area anymore, even though it's within the Santa Rosa Plain Conservation Strategy, which is the document that says this is where CTS may live. 
Right, so maybe this is not meant to be contained within the housing element, and you can tell me if it's not, but this, um, the expansion of this law we were talking about earlier, does that make it so that we don't have to say it's okay and that they can go ahead and build there? Or would the CTS potentially bar them from being able to build in areas that are habitats? Yeah, so, so that's a good point. So there are some of these streamlining laws that have been passed that say, right. They're streamlined, except if you're in these areas that are okay. sensitive. <laughs> okay. So it's okay. It's good. Of, clear yes. as mud. No, no, no. That <laughs> that is clear. Thank you. Okay. Good. I mean, I just want to make sure it's not, you know, free range on the poor. Yeah, it's kind of an apple or an salamander. oranges situation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Did you have other questions? Okay. No. no. Ben, did you have questions? You did not. Okay. All right. <laughs> Well, then I'm going to ask my questions. You'll have to be patient with me. I have them marked. Um, so first I have a typo for you, Noah. I'll get those out of the way first. Back at page 183, um, the element, um, there is down at the bottom, it's, it says hose to suit the changing needs. I think it was supposed to be homes. <laughs> Be my guess. That was my best guess. Uh, may require assistance in rehabilitating their hose. <laughs> so, I didn't know what that was. So I think homes. Okay. And then the other typo was the one I told you about on <laughs> don't laugh on page 32 or package page 208, and that is um, affordability restrictions. Um, in 4.3.3 rather than restricts. I think that that. I was pointing out that to Noah that that second sentence could be stricken because it's duplicative of what the sentence that follows it. They both say the same thing. So then okay. you don't have to worry about that typo. You just strike well, the whole you thing. You can do whatever you would like to do. Um, on packet page 195 or element page 19, I don't know what, what is more helpful to you, Noah. Um, it, in that table it talks about in the specific plan area, uh, both Santero Way and the downtown, that um, maximum density dwelling units to accommodate, that there's no maximum. Can you? Yeah, so, that? so a million houses could go in. So we've had this discussion when we were talking about the downtown specific plan. Uh, it's just that the the current density is not on an acreage base basis. It's, it's so it's unclear. Um, Councilmember Ford actually sent me an email pointing that out as well, and I have a list of uh, proposed kind of technical or clarifying language, and that's in my list to fix. Okay, so this is going to get fixed. All right. All right. Then. Um, in the element page 38, packet page 214. On the project for Katati stations, it says in the very last uh, sentence on there that it is anticipated to break ground in late 2022, and we know that didn't happen. Does, should we correct that? Not correct? Okay. We'll update it, thank you. Okay. Um, then on the next page, um, it says at the top of the page there, in the second sentence, it says programs XX and XX. And XX. I, I think they should have something other than XX in there. I don't know what, but some programs. Then um, in the element on page 68, packet page 244, um, the second paragraph is talking about the wastewater collection. It says the city of Katati owns and operates the wastewater collection. Hmm. Isn't it the city of Santa Rosa and we kind of are part of it? So we, we have the collection system because it's basically talking about the pipes. And then the city and of Santa Rosa. 1,200 acres, we're not that big. <laughs> So I'll, I'll take a look at that. Okay. Yeah. All right. It, it was the 1,200 acres of property when we're only like two square. Eight. I, that's what I was struggling with. So. Okay. Um, let's 
see. Then um, I was struggling on that T on page uh, 100 of the element packet page 276. There was a whole discussion around um, the opportunity areas, and they were talking about the education. And it talks about it being the Katadi Ronert Park Unified School District, which we know we share that with Ronert Park. Um, but it's sort of misleading because the numbers um, keep talking about um, like 5,000 students, yeah, 5,066 students um, in there. But we don't have that many children in Katadi. One of the tables that we had shows um, population by age. 5 to 14, there's 998, and 15 to 24, there's 1,107. And another table says that um, the youth population in Katadi under 18 is 1,691. So somewhere in the, you know, kind of 1,500 range of this 5,700, we don't really know of that kind of the stuff that it's talking about, these categories about them being socioeconomically disadvantaged and English learners. We, we can't attribute that to our Katadi residents, or can we? Well, I will say some of this information is uh, provided by you know the the various surveys that that Luke referenced, um, mm -hmm. yeah, and and it's That's required right, to be yeah. yeah, it's required to be referenced. Okay. So um, we can take a look at these specific points, but in some instances we will just have to kind of live with those. Okay. Kind of more broad statements where we can't drill down quite as much as we would want to, just because of how the information is provided to us. And then also the fact that we do share port boundaries with Runner Park with regards to the school. District. Yeah, because it, it kind of implies that we may have a much, much worse situation than we may have be, just because of sheer numbers, um, because they have a larger population um, than we do. Yeah, we can certainly add some context to that based on you know the census groups by age and there's some other areas in the element too where, where we mentioned as much as possible that you know there's a lot of this information is based on census tracts and you know there's right. one one the census tract that contains the westernmost area of Katadi goes all the way from Wilfred Avenue and then stretches around to Pangrove. So there's certainly some activity outside of the city that's included in some of this data. And then um, I had a general question on the um, housing element addendum evaluation. Um, you know, it talks a lot in here um, about being able to um, mitigate things and, you know, the project will go through and we'll assess this and we'll assess that and all of that. But um, since we're now being faced with um, SB 35 projects, kind of all the things that are mentioned in this document are really bypassed. So things like aesthetics and air quality and energy and GHG emissions and water and, you know, noise and all, all that stuff is really bypassed with that. So how, you know, in the big scheme of things, um, you know, how does, how does that work and at what point does it then make our um, kind of our, our addendum and our EIR not really valid? Yeah, I think the the just sort of most I think there's definitely areas where you know environmental review and some of the areas that you mentioned you know it could not have all been encompassed by the 2015 general plan update. Uh, I think just generally in terms of you know where we're coming from with having an addendum to this document is there's a sus substantial amount of development capacity that's provided for in the the general plan um, of 2015. It's a relatively recent document, so you know I think even. If you have a dozen SB 35 projects, the likelihood that the community would be quote unquote built out um, is, is probably unlikely on the basis of just the environmental analysis that was done for that document. Um, and generally, since the housing element is, is primarily a policy document, um, you know, there's no sort of the kind of land use decisions that some housing elements have to go through, like rezoning or annexations or anything that really is environmentally intensive uh, and is somewhat of a reconsideration of what the most recent general plan uh, was, you know, assuming. Uh, I, th I think those are sort of the grounds in a nutshell for why an addendum would be appropriate. Okay. I just, it, they, it, 
kind of acts like, well, don't worry about any of this because all of these aspects will be considered, but with certain things, and there's probably more laws coming down the, down the pipeline, and some of those things, you know, may not be considered. Um, my last question has to do with, um, and it's in this housing needs data report, it, it breaks these things down in um, for rent, for sale, occupied, rented, not occupied, for seasonal recreation, and then there's this other vacant. Um, I am on page, uh, packet page 715, okay? And it says, Census Bureau classifies units as other vacant if they are vacant due to foreclosure, personal family reasons, legal proceedings, repairs, renovations, abandonment, preparation for being rented or sold, or vacant for extended ab absence for reasons such as work assignment, military duty, or incarceration. What I was struggling with is this table says we have a third of our inventory that is in that other state. So I, I was struggling, could someone help me with why 32% of our um, inventory would be in that category? Yeah, so just um, overall, I think that category, it, it, as you mentioned, it has a number of different areas that qualify for other vacant. Uh, the one that we see the most is that if that number is really high and sort of, you know, high cost, you know, resort communities, um, like, the, the 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 largest area um, in large in large part is often uh, homes that are exclusively for investment and just sit empty. Uh, in addition, I would just say that you know, sort of backing up a little bit in terms of the basis of the data that you know, determining uh, what a unit is being used for, um, because you know, the state of California doesn't have you know a rental registry, rental databases, anything where. You know, that would, that would really provide the kind of granularity of data um, that would say, you know, this is what every single unit is being used for. Um, so this is really the American Community Survey and the Census um, making a best estimate. Uh, I, I, I think there's, you know, there's more extensive studies that can be done to see, you know, sort of what is the makeup of, of your vacant housing stock and, you know, sort of what is the cause behind that. Um, so I've seen some, some areas between different communities where those numbers are surprising um, and I, I don't necessarily always, um, I take them with a grain of salt, I guess is what I would say. Okay, yeah, because, I mean, if we're saying that we are lacking rental units and the like, if, you know, a third of our stock is just sitting there, I, I guess that might be something that we would need to look at from a different perspective. Yeah. So can I jump in with how I read yeah. that table? Okay, good. So, cause... So, so as I understand these bars, these are only the vacant units that are in the bars at all. See at the top it says 153. So these are only 153 vacant units in the city and this is, some of them are for of sale them. units, some of them are per rent units, some of them are other vacant okay. units. So it's not a third that of our makes overall me, stock. Okay, thank you, that, that's, that's, right. that's what I needed. Because <laughs> I'm like, this, this doesn't make sense to me. So thank you for that. Sure. Okay, that is all of my questions. Mayor, can I have, I yes. have one more question? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I'm looking, I was looking also at packet page 208 under planning and zoning incentives. And I don't know if it's just my not understanding the math on here, but if you start looking at the, uh, like in the middle of the paragraph, first paragraph, it talks about to qualify for the density bonus developments must include at least 11% and it says 15% or B says at least 20%, but then in parentheses is 24%. So I was trying to figure out what the difference in the percentages were there. Um, so with, with the density bonus, there's generally different percentages. Um, sorry, I just, as I don't have it in front of me, I will be kind of general, but um, there are, there's different, if you have deeper levels of affordability, if there's very low income, um, the amount of, uh, the percentage of units that have to be deed restricted for that group generally are lower. And I believe the 20 and 24 refer to uh, for sale units, that number is generally higher, moderate income units, those numbers are higher as well. Oh, great, thank you. <laughs> Did that answer your question, Sylvia? Yeah, no, it was just okay. a little confusing because yeah. when I see it written at 11% and then percentage in a percentage in the percentage in the in the paragraph this is in the parentheses in the parentheses it says 15%. Okay. So there wasn't really like indication of what you just explained that just shows like the lower density. Yeah, you we'll, see that, we'll, Noah? We'll take a look at that. That could be a typo. Okay. Yeah, it seems odd. Thank you for that. Does a good look catch. weird. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thank you. That was what I was yeah, okay. Thank you. And can I make one comment? You certainly may. Two square miles is over 1,200 acres, believe it or not. Is it? Okay, it is. thank you. See, I have my mathematician here. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, if there are no more questions, I can um, open this up um, to the public. And I'm sure if there's questions for you that you can, Surely. I can ask, ask them. Thank you very much. So, thank you. Thank you. I'll be nice to Luke. I don't have any questions. <laughs> um, it's more of comments. Um, hello again, Callum Weeks. Uh, you know, one of the things that my, my boss, Jen, likes to hammer home every single day is, is the importance of memorializing everything. And so I, I guess based off of what I've heard from you, Councilmember Rivers, is maybe it would behoove us um, to actually, A, have some sort of internal discussion on what you would like to see going forward, um, especially if you should be on this council in the future, but also maybe seek input from the community via a survey, something simple, relatively easy to prepare that, you know, won't strain. Uh, <laughs> won't strain Mr. Uh, uh, or well, no won't strain Noah um, with all his workload. Um, but it, it would be very, very helpful. Um, and we don't really know, for example, if, if you will be on the council or if Noah will be here or if the city council or, excuse me, the city manager will be here. So it's always great to have that um, shelved somewhere. The pro-housing designation, I'm really pleased to hear you guys are, are seeking that. And I was excited when I first saw that in the housing element. And, and certainly we look forward to helping with that and, and are, are happy to avail ourselves should you want any sort of assistance or advice. Um, I would also just say, though, um, aim high. One of the things that we've discovered is that if a jurisdiction that gains 50 points or gets a score of 50 points compared to one that gets 30, well then, in terms of prioritization of applications for these grants, the one that has 50 points will always be prioritized first over the one that gets 30. So it's actually competitive in the, like the pro housing, you know, grouping in itself. So it's, it's really, really super important that you aim for the highest possible score you can get. Um, super excited about Santero Way in respect to SB 35. Um, and as it pertains to Santero Way, really creating robust objective design standards is imperative. If you want to have a reasonable like predictability in terms of the outcome of the project, it's really important that you have solid objective design standards so you can reasonably kind of you know envision what we produce. And I, I spoke with Noah recently, and, um, and I, just to confirm, but I, I think you guys, yeah, yeah, you guys have five different designs available already online um, that kind of you know says what you're kind of trying to achieve in terms of overall design. So replicate that, increase the number of design options so that you know you can find different ways of slotting these projects in and around the community. Um, there are a number of ADU incentives you can also um, take advantage of, um, a lot of which the Napa Sonoma ADU Center um, generated over the course of the past like two years. Um, it was Renee Champ, she was the executive director, she has since stepped away um, to a new endeavor, but um, I'm happy to share that list with you and I'm happy to meet with you and, and, and talk with you more about it. I know kind of keeping them affordable is, is of the utmost importance to everyone. And there's a variety of ways and incentives available that can help us achieve that goal. So if you're interested, just let me know. I'm happy to chat with you about it. And then in terms of um, uh, actually the parking updates, I think we covered. So actually, you know what? I think I'm good there. Thank you so much for all your work. I know it's been really challenging. And I hear you on how challenging this is to get through is one of the hardest things for us to engage the, like the citizenry and to get the average Jane and Joe, the mom, you know, and, and dad and, and what have you to, to get kind of engaged in this process. It's, it's, a hard to di it's a hard thing to digest. And one of the things that Santa Rosa did, I don't know if this was built into your contract, but um, Santa Rosa created kind of a bite-sized um, little packet. It was like 30-something pages long that they, they put together. It was near the end. It was a little bit late, but they did put it out. I, I know you guys are... Noah's really busy, everyone's busy. Um, so it, it's just something to, to think about in the future. If you plan ahead, it won't be as difficult, I think, to produce. Um, so again, that goes back to my point about memorializing. So maybe next time, it'll be easier and you know, we'll, have a whole, we'll all have a better understanding of this process and of the, the substance of these, uh, of these documents. Anyways, I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much, have a wonderful evening.
Thank you. And I am not seeing any attendees on Zoom. Yes, that is okay. correct, Mayor Harvey. All right, then I will bring it back. Any more questions? Yes, Laura. Madam yeah. Mayor, I'm not sure if you opened and closed the public hearing, but it would be a good idea to do that before we uh, take action on this item. Okay, I will do it again. I will open the public hearing. <laughs> And we public hearing. Yes, sorry. Open the public hearing. And do we have to let the audience speak yet again? Would you like to speak again? Uh, I'm good. You're good. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. And, Thank you, Mayor. And again, there is no one on Zoom. So then I will close the public hearing. Okay. <laughs> All right, Laura. Yeah, I, I thought we were going to have some discussion and deliberation, so I saved a lot okay. of comments for this part. Okay. Um, I had some comments. Uh, one, I'm going to go by packet page. So on packet page 62, on the right-hand column, there's a, a response that we're making to the site's inventory, and it doesn't, our response doesn't seem to make sense, just grammatically. It says, the analysis identifies, improves, and exacerbated conditions. So we made it better and worse. <laughs> um, so and then it says, um, and program actions to promote equitable quality of life. It doesn't make sense in response to what they're asking. They're asking us, are we, you know, have we, have the, has the set of sites made things better or worse? And then we're not really responding to that. So I think that needs some improvement. Um, let's see, on packet page 67, a few comments. Under C, housing programs, program 1-3, it talks about amendments we need to make to program one three, and then it, the response addresses program one two. So I don't know if that's on purpose. Or was there something in one two that sort of was relevant to one three? I didn't have a chance to check that out, or is that just a typo? It should be one three. Let me see what's on page thirty one. Page um, hang on. Page 31 of the of the actual of the, element of the element. Program one two responds to that comment. Okay, that was made on program one three. Okay. Um. Uh, also on page 67, there's one that talks about uh, uh just above there it talks about approval time and requests lesser densities. It looks like our response only addresses the um, densities. Saying we haven't we haven't received any requests for lesser densities, um, but the the comments from HDD said we must address um, timelines as well. So I'm wondering, are they going to be looking for something more from us on that one? We may have addressed in a different section and just not cross reference that. So I'll make a note. Okay. Yeah, and I, I can confirm that that was addressed in okay. another section of the TBR. Okay, great. I guess the way I read that was it was in the context of requests for lesser densities that then you you have to give a length of time, not just in general. That, that's just, and so the city said we haven't received any, so. Okay, I, maybe but that's, that's just maybe the way. That's I, the way. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought it was kind of wrapping in just approval mm -hmm. times in general as well, but maybe not. Laura, can I just add it? That sentence is a little bit complete. It ends on under approval time request letter. That first sentence ends with approval f application for building permits at potentially period. So I wonder if it's incomplete. Yeah. That's, that's... So those are the HCD comments. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Can we send our request for them to amend <laughs> that? <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. The. Okay, here's this one's a little more substantial. On page 68, um, there's one place where it felt like they went, they really had a comment for us, which is about they didn't like that we just have our brochures out on the table. Program 4-2, city, 
The, the program should be revised to include outreach beyond a brochure on the city's counter, as well as specify what actions will result from participation meetings. So I went and looked at our response on that, which I think was on packet page 126, which I'm going to move to. And it's a little bit odd. We've got some sort of additional things we're going to do, but they're listed under the timeline instead of being listed as additional tasks. And it doesn't seem like there's much added here that's really, um, you know, substantial new outreach. So I'm a little concerned that on that one we're not necessarily going to be doing what they're asking for. Yeah, I think this may be similar. We have a substantial amount of outreach efforts built through the whole um, housing element and programs, but I agree we could reference that better to ensure, and then I'll just point that out and, and uh, uh, the Four Leaf team can take a look as to okay. how to cross-reference more. Do you see what I'm talking about, the time frame on page yes. 26? It's just a, like kind of an odd placement. Okay, those were all of my comments. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm happy. Yes. I, I just have uh, general comments about, I want to um, acknowledge the incredible amount of work that went into this on staff and consultant parts. Um, and I sympathize with Councilmember Rivers trying to jump into this at the last minute of an 18-month process. And um, so I just want to point out that, that for people who have been in the process the whole time, you know, the, the track changes version was very helpful because there was a very limited amount of text that was new to us. Um, so those of you, I sympathize for those of you who are seeing this for the first time. Um, so the other comment is just, uh, if this was a good letter from HCD, I'd hate to see the bad <laughs> ones because this feels like such level of nitpicking that it drove me nuts just to read it. So I'm very um, glad you were able to work through it and not freak out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also would like to um, extend my thanks to everyone that worked on this. There were there was a lot of work, and the community did a lot of work. I mean, we received. Um, for those of you that looked at the surveys, um, we've received over over the 18 months a lot of input um, from folks, both letters as well as comments to the surveys and participation and and uh, participation at different events and things like that. So um, the community really has has stepped up and and looked at a lot of this. Um, so I think it's a, a group effort by all involved uh, to try and bring this um, over to the finish line. And um, I was just hoping on the HCD letter that they were just trying to be nit nitpicky because they, as doing their job, they have to find something. So I think that they <laughs> they wouldn't feel if they were doing their job. If they didn't, then they probably have a minimum number of pages that they have to, <laughs> to write to everyone. So they're just trying to spread the wealth, I think. So, are there any other comments? If not, I believe um, we need to, let's see, based on the analysis and findings, the staff report, the attached resolutions, Community Development Department and Planning Commission adopt a resolution. So is that way, where we are at? I think so. We are at that, okay. That's what I thought, but <laughs> I just wanted to be Sure. So, would someone like to? I'd be, I'd be happy to. Okay. Uh, I'd be happy to move a resolution uh, adopting general plan amendment to update the housing element of the general plan for the period 2023 to 31 to affirmatively further fair housing and to comply with all aspects of state housing element law. And, uh, and I'll second the motion. Okay, and do we need to mention the EIR in our? In reading the, the motion and the, the vote, please. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm just okay. reading the That's actual, all right. I know. The actual yeah. resolution. That's title. all right. Uh, it's a little confusing. Oh, so it's a separate resolution. No. 
It's the it's one of the findings. Uh, it should be the first finding in the resolution. But you could just identify that council uh, finds the CEQA addendum to the general plan EIR is adequate analysis yeah. for the housing element. Okay. Okay. Uh, so right, add to the resolution <laughs> that the uh, EIR addendum uh, is recommended for approval. That is your motion and second the motion. Okay. All right. Um, then um, we'd, we'd like to take a roll call vote with that then. Council Member Rivers. I'm going to abstain. Council Member Lemus. Yes. Council Member Ford. Yes. Uh, Vice Mayor Spark. Yes. Mayor Harvey. Yes. All right. Good job, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, team. Now, let's see, where are we? I guess Noah's still in the hot seat here because we're going to move to the regular agenda, and that is the 2022 Housing Annual Production Report and Information Update. Thank you, Mayor Harvey and Council. Just briefly, um, I just wanted to highlight a few things. Uh, this annual production report is the last one of the fifth uh, housing element cycle. Um, it's required to be presented annually before we submit it to the state on April 1st. Um, so just a few things I wanted to highlight. Um, we essentially take every year a process to summarize where we are with housing element implementation. So next year you will see a uh, very similar format, which I will also apologize for the format. It's state provided and we cannot change it. So it's uh, I did my best to try to get it into a readable format in your packet, um, and I apologize to anyone at home who maybe struggled it's awful. with it. It, it, is, it is. But so it's mandated. We're not allowed to affect that. Um, but it's just because it's the last year, um, just point out a few things. Um, there's a lot in the staff report on the background for housing elements in general, which I hope that was somewhat helpful. Um, our last RENA cycle, we got 137 units assigned to us. And we were actually able to construct 143 units over the last eight years. However, um, we were assigned 35 very low income units and we only were able to construct 13 of those. So we did fall short by 22 units, although I'm hoping to revise that slightly uh, for the Windwood project that we did um, get a new uh, deed restriction on. Um, it's, other, it's also worth pointing out uh, that I, it is... Noah, uh, just, to, just to be clear, you said you're not actually obligated to produce those units. You're obligated right. to plan for them and report the results. And so your report indicates that you did a pretty good job of, of meeting the, the, the planning requirement. Absolutely correct, and thank you for clarifying. It, people tend to forget that, so I, I make, a, make a point of reminding everyone. Uh, but I would just highlight Table B. That's where we kind of, uh, in, in every year when we present this, that is where the kind of housing production uh, has identified kind of where we are uh, in Table B on the spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's uh, it's better format. Uh, earlier, it's, it says packet. It says packet page eight ninety in the bottom right corner. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so point, point out uh, Table B, and then the other thing that's uh, worth noting is Table D, which is more has more narrative on how we're doing with implementing each of the uh, programs. And so next year when we come back, you'll see um, this similar format, and I will stri strive to make it a little bit more clear and easy to use, but it basically reports on where we are with implementing these programs. Um, we will have some dates associated with it. We'll tie some of this effort into our budget requests uh, and strategic goals that we present to the City Council. So um, we're in a unique position in that we're wrapping up the fifth cycle and we have kind of a whole new laundry list of things to tackle. But I also really appreciated the approach of doing everything we could to kind of continue the goals that we've already had and just target them to the newest, um, most recently identified community needs. Um, so with that, uh, I also did include um, some information that's worth noting that the only new building permits uh, issued in 22 for, were for accessory dwelling units. So it's just worth noting they are going to be critical to us being able to achieve housing production in Katadi. 
Um, and then I included a summary of some of the housing law changes. I just can't help myself because it's never ends, it seems. And so every opportunity I get to try to provide some education for folks on those, uh, I try to take those. And so that's just kind of background information, um, but you can have it for reference and please follow up with me directly if you have any questions on any of those things. Uh, It'll because, change again next week, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> that could be the case. But with that, um, uh, that's all I had to say. I just wanted to kind of highlight some of those points. Questions? Yes, Laura. Just one quick one. Um, the, a lot of the tables in this um, spreadsheet were blank. I just wanted to make sure that was because we had nothing reportable and not there was some technical error where nothing was. Yeah, there's, there's the, the state has continuously added new reporting criteria as a part of all this legislation, and a lot of it just didn't apply to us, or uh, we didn't have any surplus land. Um, coming up for sale. So it's those not types like of when we converted this to a PDF, all the data no. disappeared. Okay. It's just it's a, it's a required element of the format that we didn't have anything to put into it, and they they don't even let you indicate that in the template. Ben, did you have a question? Just a quick question about the legislative summary. That's only legislation that's passed and now law, right? It's not. <laughs> I will never include any of the pending because okay, it's, uh, yeah. I don't okay, know thanks. how anyone can keep up with right. it. It moves hourly. Sylvia, did you have any questions? No. Okay. Um, um, one, one thing that, so I may be misreading this, but everything that I see seem, seems to always be about new development, and I'm wondering about what already existed, what is already existing, making it ADA accessible, you know, making it, um, affordable, you know, converting what we already have. What what do we have for that? So that's a great question. There there is a section in the report for preservation of units. So that's like the Windwood example that we gave where we we were able to kind of reallocate or or represerve those affordable housing units and also uh renovation or rehabilitation. So uh one of the programs that is in the housing element is to create a fund that would allow the city to um, assist low-income folks who happen to be homeowners with keeping their properties up, maybe their furnace goes out, so maintaining the livability, and then also making those kind of quality of life improvements such as ADA. Okay, and, and do we have such a fund, or is it still in development? Well, so we have uh, the Affordable Housing Fund, uh, and it, it is summarized, the, it's about $250,000 in that currently, um, which is part of the reason why the, the financial commitment we wanted to make uh, was trying to be um, thoughtful per project because we have a limited amount. Uh, so we will likely utilize that and then seek uh, additional grant monies, those types of things to try to backfill that. Uh, and there are some dedicated funding sources, home grants are one of them, and the county CDC, uh, Community Development Commission, uh, has a program uh, for the same thing that our residents can apply to. And we're gonna expand on uh, the information we provide to folks. Right, and, and I'm aware of the county stuff. I just keep seeing it in our in our element, and I'm just wondering, you know, what what our city is doing specifically for our residents. Thank you. Okay. Um, there's a, a couple of, I have a question. Uh, there's a typo in there. Um, on 3-8 reviewing process fees, uh, these aren't page numbered, um, so forgive me. It's the, I don't even know how to say this, the Katadiushan station, I think, in there. I think that it should be Katadi stations. Um, and then the next one it, um, is monitoring use permit and requirements for affordable housing. And it talks about that, um, uh, oh. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Oh, I think I, sorry, I answered my own question on that one. So sorry. Um, on the very last of your written things, it talked about the city um, has a planned use, land use 101 presentation. And did we really do that? In 22? 23. Well, 
Yeah, that's well. I thought it was 23, but I went back and looked at my calendar, and I didn't see anything in 22. So usually do them every two years with the every new two election. Years. Okay, so that should say 23. Okay. Um, yeah, I wish these tables were better, but th those were my only questions. It was great. My a kind of again what what um, I'm struggling with this is this whole. Um, deed restricted versus not. I mean, what does that really do to this? I mean, I saw in here, which I feel is good, that HCD kind of wants to know from a reporting perspective, but how, how do they look at that? Um, because they're asking for it to be re recorded, but what if all of them are non-deed restricted? Do they kind of look at that in a bad light or? Yeah, I don't <laughs> think they, they would ever let a city um, use all non-deed restricted units to meet their certain of their arena calculations. Okay. But they just, they and to their credit, which it's appreciated by the city yeah. that we can take credit for some of these units, they've done market studies and, and have found generally ADUs are often rented below market values. And so if we're really doing things to support ADU production, we should get credit for the fact that we have some housing that's being used as at below market rates. I just thought it was interesting because they do make that distinction in their reporting, but it's just like, well, what do they do with that information? And what? what and they've asked us to. Us? Yeah. They've asked us to try to to do everything we can to support when we find that, and so that's why we've started surveying uh, ADU the people who are building ADUs and saying, how are you going to use these? What are your anticipated rents? It's not a scientific process, but it does give us some support. So it's possible that over time, since that ADU concept and JADU con concept is really from meeting an affordability, is kind of new. Um, so maybe over time, they might change some of the, the policies and reporting around that a, a, as you know, kind of time goes on. Absolutely possible. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure I'm clear. So below market and affordable don't mean the same thing, right? Affordable by design is an idea that some place the market rate for some units meets affordable um, affordability. Yeah, so that's a good point. I don't think that because, yeah, an affordable by design unit is just a smaller unit that just naturally rents for less money because real estate is priced per square foot. But I, it would be interesting to see where we go with that into the future as more effort is put into that and if HDD gives you any credit for those, but even if they're not deed restricted. Right now, I would not be taking credit for for a large project unless I had demonstrated like I could see their advertising for how much they're renting it for and it was able to be documented that that was below market rates. And then again, we might ultimately get into Again, what are they going to do with this deed restricted versus versus not? So, I think time will tell. <laughs> yes, Kay. Um, I just wanted to request: Is it possible to get um, eight eighty-seven? You know, a little larger. I struggled with this for a significant uh, amount of time. I, I can try. Oh, okay. There's an electronic version that's very clear and readable, and you can zoom into and all that. Okay, uh, is that I, something we can? I, I, send it, I can send it to you directly. And it's, okay. It's uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. It's just I when just it converts. I would like to read. I really can't read it at all. I want. I just want to read what's there. I, I tried with a magnifying I glass too. and even struggled. And I loaded it up to six hundred and thirty percent and could still not read it. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Yeah. The test. All right. Um, so I will, um, is any more questions? Well, I just want to say because okay. it says um, annual element progress report and that's why I really like to see it, that's all. Because it sounds like something that would be really important to see. So thank you. Okay. If there's no more questions, then I will open this item up for public comment. You're good, <laughs> you're good on that, okay. And I am still not seeing any attendees on Zoom. That is correct, Mayor. Okay, Hardy. then I will close public comment on that item and bring it back. And this item is just to um, give concerns or direction to staff and file the report, is that correct? So correct, we, we plan to submit it on Thursday to the state ahead of the April 1st deadline. Okay, good job. 
All right. Then moving on. Um, gee, Damien, you've been quiet all night. I guess it's your turn. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to be. Uh, I'll try to be brief. So, um, just to reiterate something that the uh, mayor said earlier during announcements, um, the application period is still open, but it's closing this week for planning commissioners. So we have two spots, um, and we're still um, receiving applications until Thursday. So if you uh, if you know anyone, encourage them to apply. And um, that also includes library commissioner. So those are both out right now. Um, it, I believe library commissions. Library commission ends April 14th, I believe. April 14th, okay, yeah. Yeah, planning commissions, though, this week, this Thursday. Um, all right, so uh, big news. Administrative services is back. I don't know if you noticed. They're back in City Hall. They're back from their exile. Um, <laughs> and uh, they're almost, they almost have a window, but pretty soon. Anyway, they're, they're uh, anyone the that wants to. The plastic doesn't count. Hmm? The plastic doesn't count. <laughs> The sneeze guard that they have, yeah, they, um, yeah, they're, they'll have a window soon. But they're back in there, so if you need anything from admin services, paying water bills, dog licenses, business licenses, whatever, they're they're there now. So, but go through Damien. Hmm? <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So on some, uh, the windows. The, so one of the reasons they were, well, the main reason they were out is because the window project. The window project is slowly <laughs> moving forward. The rain seems to keep on disrupting construction around here. Um, but you've seen maybe on the side of the city hall building that the scratch coat for the stucco is up, and then they're going to put the final coat on and then paint. Um, we did receive bids uh, for painting today. So there, this is exterior of city hall, um, the community center, and the Katati room. And the good news is is that the bids came in half of the engineer's estimate. So. That's great news. Um, so we'll be bringing that to council in the near future for uh, hopefully award. Um, Katati Park should be, uh, they just keep on waiting to pour concrete because they can't pour concrete in the rain. <laughs> but hopefully soon they'll be able to pour concrete and then um, all the stuff should go in fairly quickly after that except for the restroom which will lag by a month or so. And um, the Civic Center uh, window replacement project, by the way, is the next project that's going to get going, aside from the street projects that I've talked about before um, that are waiting on a break in the rain to get going. And the housing element, we talked about that quite a bit tonight, but that's going to be submitted to HCD here shortly. And then um, finally on some uh, just community stuff, recreation things, on Monday, April 3rd, um, we will be removing um, this is actually, I'm not at recreation yet, sorry, false alarm. So Monday, April 3rd, we'll be removing the outdoor dining tents that were installed in 2020. So those are, those are all the tents that are in the streets are going to be coming out, um, with the exception of the one in front of flagship tap room. So um, it's not in the street, it's on, a, it's on private property right there on the parking lot. But um, we're leaving that one there for now um, because they still do not have electricity. That was going to be my question. <laughs> yeah, they still don't have electricity, so um, we're leaving it there, and just um, we don't want to make their situation any worse at the moment, so we're just leaving it and allowing them to operate out of that until they, until the landlord finally gets their um, electricity. Do they have an uh, estimated completion date? Um, no, do we have any new news? Nothing that I would feel comfortable mm -hmm. quoting. I mean, they've it's been out often. for like. Over Since a year? Memorial Day. Yeah, a, a year. Yeah, okay. That just yeah. seems excessive. It, it is significantly excessive. At some point, they're going to have to stop blaming COVID and supply chain disruptions and mm -hmm. actually get it done. But, mm -hmm. yeah, anyway. Um, all right, so uh, now I'm really moving on to recreation things. So um, <laughs> last week, we had 12 campers at our Camp Katati Spring Break Camp. and. Um, we had, a, we had a great time. It was um, actually a good opportunity for us to get our camp staff back into the swing of things and um, prepare for summer camps, which begin on June 12th. And so if uh, on that note, if you're looking for camps for your children in the summer, we have them. We have um, the Camp Katati Day Camp, Spanish Camp, multiple children's theater camps, and four weeks of farm camps. We're also offering um, for, uh, for our rec for recreation, um, we have a lot of teenagers that work on our rec programs. 
that help out um, as uh, counselors or um, camp managers. And uh, we have a CIT or counselor and training program again this summer to get uh, real world job training to be a future camp counselor. Those are typically younger, like 15, 15 year olds, I think, that then move into, they graduate into camp counselors. And we have an ongoing relationship with um, the ranch. You know, so we have, uh, Ashley does, uh, she goes out and lectures out there for their, um, for their programs. And then they, you know, they have students that work in our programs here as well. So it's um, worked out to be a good, um, good relationship. We're currently recruiting um, uh, summer camp counselors. So if you know any teens that want to do some uh, counseling, <laughs> do some camp work this, this summer, uh, let us know. And um, that's on our jobs page of the website also. And we're interviewing for that in April. And just as a final reminder that camps are filling up fast, so sign up early to reserve your space. All right, so this Saturday we have a lot going on. It's going to be a very busy weekend. Uh, Bunny Brunch is this Saturday. It's sold out again this year. We do have a wait list in case there are cancellations, um, but we're not taking signups at the door the day of the event. We do have some availability for Bunny Grams, so if people want some delivered um, Bunny Grams, there's still room. Um, it's a basket full of goodies, including stuffed eggs, candies, treats, and, and uh, more. And they're going to be delivered. Those will be delivered on Friday, April 7th. Um, so also Saturday is uh, Farmster's Sheep Shearing Soiree. So if you want to uh, learn how to shear a sheep, come on down to the ranch, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's free, and it's a once-in-the-year opportunity to uh, learn how to do that and watch how sheep get sheared, followed by a tour of the ranch. And then finally, um, that afternoon of that of this Saturday, Sandy Loam will be hosting their spring gardening family workshop where families learn the basics of preparing garden beds, preparing seed starts or transfers, weeding, composting, mulching, and so forth, getting, getting, kind of getting your garden ready for the spring and for planting. This is $6 per child. Registration is required, and you can sign up on our recreation website. And then um, finally, just a quick note that later this spring, we have the Spring Festival at the Veranda Fleddy Ranch. It coincides with, coinciding with Earth Day. That's um, coming up in the community camp out also at the ranch, so it's an overnight at the ranch. And a community yard sale here at um, Katati Room, basically a big, community-wide yard sale that we hold here every year that um, with the proceeds that benefit the rec, uh, recreation department. And uh, with that, I'll just stop there and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, I have a question about um, the Spanish camp. Um, so I read through the, well, first thing, it looks like it's like about $300. So I was wondering, is there are there any scholarships available for people? Um, I would, so I would talk to Ashley because we do have a scholarship fund. You do? Okay. Yeah. I mean, some things like the, you know, the, uh, uh, we take donations at, a, at events, but we also, you know, the community yard sale, things like that help offset some costs for people because we try to make sure that everyone, it's, things are accessible for everyone. Even the Spanish camp is a private um, instructor, but okay. um, Ashley would be the one to talk to. To okay. Confirm. Um, well, then my, I mean, I wasn't asking for myself, just yeah. in general. But um, then the other question is, when I was reading the description, it made it sound like it is going to be in Spanish, but it wasn't clear if it was meant for, like, native speakers of Spanish or if it was meant for kids who are Spanish learners. Like, what what is the intention of the program? My understanding is it's Spanish learners, mostly. I mean, it's not like, I don't think they get into grammar and things that native speakers maybe that can speak it but don't know the grammar yet. Um, so I think it's more geared towards, my understanding is it's more geared towards um, learners, Spanish learners. Okay, thank you. Yes, Laura? Thank you. Um, I had a question about the um, tents coming down. Um, do, do you have anything you can share about the parklet survey that went out or, or what, wh where we're going with that? Yeah, so we're coming um, to council on the 11th, April 11th, to talk about parklets. So it's right on the heels. Although um, we haven't got a lot of interest from businesses at this point about parklets, um, but we're still we still move forward with putting a lot of the pieces in place so that we can um, engage with businesses if they do ask us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It seems like a lot of the businesses that might want them already have some outdoor space, correct? Um, like when when you're thinking downtown. Right. Um, yeah, like Redwood Cafe has quite a bit of outdoor space already. Um, Cafe Salsa has some. They've approached us for 
maybe some sort of per more permanent cover, but not really an expanded parklet. Um, the, really, the, the business that's the most interested right now is flagship for obvious reasons. But I don't know if they're interested. I, I mean, I think they're interested in some long-term thing, but they haven't gotten to that point yet. They're still trying to figure out how they're operating now. So anyway, this, this, the program that we'll be talking about on the 11th will um, we'll hopefully address when, the, you know, when those businesses approach us and want to do something. Um, I, I can't recall where I heard about it, but I understood that one of the businesses, one of our sort of core businesses is closing. Did they reach out to the city at all before that happened? N they did not to me, no. Okay. Yeah, down to earth. Um, yeah. Right, cafe closed. Um, they, they had a Windsor location too that had closed earlier, I believe, um, in, in COVID, and this was their other location. But um, they were very happy with the tent, but obviously they can't use it anymore. Yeah, I guess I just want to express my sorrow that they've gone. They were really delicious sandwiches. Uh, on a, on a and, happy, and very nice people as well. On a happier note, I have heard that Sal's Pizzeria is coming back. Oh. Yeah. So I think in the same space, but same space. that's wonderful. Yeah. Sal's back, huh? <laughs> Different owner. This time it's actually Sal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny. <laughs> Any other questions on the city manager's report? All right. And then we will move on to council member reports. Laura. I attended the education committee meeting on Thursday, March 16th. Um, it, there wasn't too much to report. It, you know, everybody shared out about their own jurisdiction, but just a few points of perhaps interest to folks. Um, the Roanoke Parks Katati School District is moving to um, a summer enrichment uh, summer enrichment academy approach to summer school, so that rather than it being a remedial type of thing, it's more they're going to be offering enrichment classes that are very intended to be very engaging, um, and just provide a t totally different experience for for summer school students. Um, so they're working with SSU and with the with the city of Roanoke Park, I think they mentioned, to develop um, sort of like robust offerings for this enrichment academy. Um, also, Rancho Katati High School is um, finalizing a guaranteed admission memorandum of understanding with SSU. So that'll be nice for our high school students. Um, a little bit of sort of discouraging news from the School of Education at SSU. Um, they, at, at the time of our meeting, they had only had 111 applicants to their teacher credential program, which apparently is, is really low. Um, so they extended the application deadline and um, the director of that department shared that they're just anecdotally seeing that um, people are getting poached to other school districts. Their graduates are, are leaving. They can get paid more money, just baseline, more higher salary in lower cost of living areas too. So not only higher salary when you take into account cost of living, but just higher dollar amount in lower cost of living areas. Um, the Central Valley is paying, a lot of school districts there are paying pretty good salaries. And so we're having huge trouble retaining teachers and um, getting people to apply for the teacher credential program because of the salaries here and the cost of living. So that was sort of sad to hear. Um, and we had some updates about the safe routes to school funding streams and the way that the school district is using some of that, which I could share more info if anyone's interested. Thank you. Okay. Kay, do you have anything? Um, yeah, uh, I think there were four things that happened between the last time we met and now. Um, the first one, uh, Sylvia and I um, uh, were invited to introduce ourselves at the Southern Sonoma County um, Democratic Club um, meeting, which was really nice. Um, and then the 22nd, I had the coffee with Kay um, at uh, Redwood Cafe and um, had a former council member, George Barrich, come, and then also uh, Lori Alderman, which was really great. Um, had some potato skins and really great conversation. Um, and then um, on the 23rd, 
Um, I went to the Sonoma County Alliance Political Action Committee um, gathering at a winery, um, and that was really nice. Got to meet a lot of really um, friendly people. Samantha Rodriguez was there, uh, the Runner Park mayor, and we hung out and had fun. Um, and then finally, um, just sort of related, um, the Katadi Historic um, Historical Society had an outing at Crane Ranch, um, and we went on a historical museum tour, which was pretty cool. And um, I know there's been discussion about um, potentially um, renovating the barn um, out at the Filetti here, and uh, Filetti uh, Farm here, and um, there was lots of really, really great ideas. Um, with what the Crane um, family has done with their ranch museum and ways of displaying larger um, farming equipment in a really interesting way. So, um, yeah, very busy couple of weeks. Sophia? I don't have uh, much to report, but I um, am stepping down as a founding member of Los Cien after mm -hmm. 13 and a half years. I'll be, I'll be on an advisory board for them, but I won't be a regular board member, so. I have just other things are busy in my life, so I don't have any other uh, regular reports. Ben? Nothing? Okay, um, I attended the Waste Management Agency meeting on 316, and they approved the budget for next year, which is good. Um, they are having to um, raise their um, fees, so the fee um, will be going up by um, the surcharge will be going up 65 cents, so from 7.95 a ton up 65 cents to 8.60 to help cover um, the costs. So trying to keep that down as low as we can, we were able to utilize some of the reserves in order to to keep that down. So always balancing that that um, need to raise the fees and the reserves. Um, the new guides, the new. Uh, Zero waste guides for 2023 are out, so you can get those online. Or I, did ours get delivered here yet? Oh, I haven't yet? seen those yet. Okay, all right. Yeah. Well, um, well, we should make sure that you get those. So, so that was that. And I attended um, the uh, League of California Cities um, Police um, Policy Committee, and they had a really interesting speaker, um, Sam Quinones. Um, who's written a couple of books, but he was talking about successes that they have had um, mostly in a couple of different jails back east where they have taken a, a wing of the jail and people volunteer voluntarily sign up and they put them through pro a program so that they're not just sitting in jail. What they're doing is they're, they're um, getting rehab, they're getting education, they're getting training, and so that they're ready to go out into society again um, when, when, they, when they are released from jail and they're finding that if they get it at that level when they're, um, when they're in jail, it's been pretty successful um, in, in not having people, you know, have their recidivism, I can't even say that word. Anyways, coming back again and keeping them from going to prison. So there's a few different jails across the country that are trying that as a as a means to kind of get people kind of retrained and, and um, you know get what they need so that they don't go back into just doing whatever it was they were doing because most of the individuals that they work with you know kind of are in this circle of of drugs and and that and they're just not getting the help that they need to do that. So I thought that that was a, an interesting an interesting program um, that they talked about that's been successful. And those are all my committee reports that I have. So with that, we can move on to public comment on non-action agenda items. And we have lost our audience here. <laughs> they have left us and. I and went, still no attendees still on no, Zoom. Okay, I went dark for some reason on my iPad. So with that then, um, is there any information received after the agenda was posted? 
other than uh, just the, letters? the two letters that were provided okay. um, and are on the web agenda as well. Okay. And they were in regards to um, SB 423. We received two letters and they were given to us and, and back in the back of the room. So with that, it is now 819 and we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thanks all.